this might be the biggest crowd for a talk I have ever had. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do today is talk uh, a little bit about the Boulder Batholith and specifically some of the work that I've done in the Boulder Batholith. Uh, I'm a field geologist with the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. Uh, I've been living in Butte for about four years now um, and really just love my job. Okay, so I'm going to explain a little bit about what it is that I do uh, and, and hope, uh, hopefully teach you something that you didn't know before you were here today. Uh, okay, so the Boulder Bath Lift, we've all seen this, drive up over Home State Pass, and just these beautiful spires of granite, big boulders weathering out of the uh, hillside. You know, my kids love playing on these things. So what is it? Um, geologically speaking, this is an old magma chamber. Okay, so this was a big body of uh, it's not molten, but partially molten, really hot rock that's crystallizing at depth. Okay. Uh, through several uh, billions of years and lots of geologic processes later, this thing has since been uplifted uh, and exposed to the surface today. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the volcanic deposits we see associated with this uh, ancient magma chamber, uh, as well as some of the ore deposits that we find here. Okay, so I'll know about Butte. Uh, Butte is a world famous uh, copper district. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how that happened. Okay, uh, quickly, let me just talk about some of the methods and techniques that I use. Uh, I'm not expecting many of you guys to be familiar with any of these. Uh, the first is field mapping. Okay, this is really just boots on the ground, walking around the mountains, looking at rocks, uh, taking samples, drawing pretty pictures on maps, sketching notes in field books. Okay, really uh, simple uh, technique, but you know I've, I've got a, a special training to do this kind of thing. Uh, geochemistry. Okay, so I'll collect a piece of rock, I'll uh, grind it up into a gravel, and I'll send it off to a lab. They'll turn that gravel into a powder, run it through uh, some machines, uh, and analyze its composition. Okay, the reason I do that is because uh, it can help tell me what kind of rock I'm dealing with. So for example, the salt, the granite, the rhyolite, virtually any name for any rock is based on the composition of that rock or the chemical makeup of the rock. Petrology, uh, this refers to understanding how the rock formed. Specific geochemical characteristics of rock types can help us understand where they came from and how they came from. Okay, so that's why I do that. Geochronology, this involves studying the age of things. Okay, so this is another tool that I use. Again, it involves collecting a piece of rock. Uh, in this case, you want to separate out the minerals because the minerals hold the key to its age. Okay. Uh, there's a couple different techniques. One is uranium lead zircon. Okay, so in this case, we will separate out the zircon, which is a mineral phase in the rock. Uh, the advantage of uh, zircons is that they're durable. Okay, so these things will not go away. They're, uh, I think, there's a three and a half billion year old zircon found recently. These things stick around forever. Um, okay. Uh, Another technique is potassium argon dating. Okay, and this involves using potassium rich minerals, things like sanidine, hornblende, biotite. Okay, so these two uh, dating techniques involve different minerals. They're based on the same principle, and that's radioactive decay of isotopes. Um, I don't want to get too technical here, but elements have different isotopes. Isotopes are simply the same element with different masses very important because uh, in order to get an age, we need to separate out the minerals, we need to heat it up. Heating it up releases the elements, and then we put it into a mass spectrometer, which you can really think of as a small version of the solar system. Okay? It spins those tiny masses around, and it separates them and counts them. Okay. So that's how we back calculate out ages, okay, by looking at the isotope ratios. The isotope ratios are a function of time. They decay through time. So 
some examples of that would be potassium, K, R, T, D. So what we're doing here is getting a crystallization age of points. Okay, now we'll get back into some things that might be more familiar. Uh, okay, so the title of my talk, uh, Boulder Batholith, a relic of the late uh, Mesozoic uh, Cordillerian Arc. Okay, that's, a, that's a mouthful. That's a lot of words. <laughs> What, what we're looking at is an old piece of a volcanic arc that used to go right through southwest Montana 80 million years ago. Okay? Here's a fancy reconstruction of what the landscape might have looked like 80 million years ago. Uh, this is based on several observations by several geologists over several decades. Okay? Looking at where we see mudstones, where we see igneous rocks, that sort of thing. Piecing together what the landscape used to look like. The significance of the Cordilleran uh, arc is that it extended all along the coastline of the continent, much like it does today in Washington and Oregon and uh, Northern California. Okay, those are all volcanoes that are forming above a subduction zone where the two plates are colliding. Okay. Eighty billion years ago, that situation was happening right here in Montana. Uh, why are people so interested in this system? Well, uh, there are world-class copper molybdenum deposits associated with this igneous activity. Okay, we've got one right here outside the door. <laughs> okay, but it's not the only one. We see similar things in Arizona, Nevada, Utah. All part of this magmatic arc 80 million years ago. Okay, um, what do I do specifically? Well, I'm really lucky I get paid to go out and make maps and do this kind of stuff. I'm one of very few people that, that gets to do this still, and I'm very fortunate. Uh, so the area that I'm looking at here is the Butte. Uh, this is the Butte North 30 by 60 quadrangle. This is basically just referring to the area of, of the land. Uh, here's a simplification of the main igneous units in the Butte North area. We've got the boulder batholith marked by this uh, white pattern. On the flanks of the boulder batholith with this gray right here, we have what's known as the Elkhorn Mountains volcanics. But on both flanks of the batholith, these things are exposed. They're co-magmatic with the batholith. That means that they formed on top of the, of the batholith. So the batholith, the magma mm -hmm. chamber underground, <coughs> Volcanics that are now exposed on the flanks were actually erupting <coughs> at the surface 80 million years ago. Okay. Right in the middle of that, we've got an Eocene or much younger volcanic field, and this is the Lowland Creek volcanics. Okay. If you drive from Butte to Anaconda, you're driving right through the Lowland Creek volcanics. All those really differentiated roads with red outcrops that you see on the road. These are that's the Lowland Creek volcanic. Okay, what I'm going to focus on today are these uh, co-magmatic, plutonic, volcanic equivalents, the Batholith and the Elkhorn Mountain Volcanics. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to focus on the east side, where contact between those volcanic rocks and the Batholith is exposed. Uh, this is some work I've been doing with a professor and some students at Oregon State University. They got money uh, from the USGS EDMAP program. Basically, it's a program designed to, to keep teaching students to be field geologists. Okay, so uh, some students came out from Oregon State last summer, and they mapped this quadrangle, which they're working on right now. Uh, I got money through the state map program to map these two quadrangles. Okay, and I'm working on getting those published right now. So I'm going to show you guys some uh, preliminary results from these studies that we've been doing in the last few summers. skipped over this, but, you know, here we are in western Montana, uh, some of the big geologic features of the Boulder Crust Belt, uh, so the older rocks, the rocks that are even older than the Boulder Batholith, have all been compressed and folded together. Perhaps not coincidentally, in modern times, this whole fold thrust belt is now stretching apart, and it's being marked by quaternary seismicity, 
earthquakes. Okay? So this is where the earthquakes occurred, right on top of the old old thrust belt. Okay, uh, so many of you are, are familiar with this area. Uh, I-90 goes right down here. Here's White Hole, Golden Sunlight Mine, Bull Mountain. Okay, I did most of my mapping the last couple summers in Bull Mountain. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, I want to set up some of the big uh, ore deposits that we find in this area. Uh, so north of Bull Mountain, we've got the world famous Elkhorn District. This is something people knew about before Butte, even. Uh, if we look at a simple cross section through that, the geologic relationships are we've got the batholith basically intruding and cooking these older sediments. Okay, so as that magma crystallizes, it begins to cook and react with these older rocks. It's got fluids that are coming off of itself, we call those magmatic fluids. It also heats up the groundwater. So what you end up getting is this big circulating system of really hot water that concentrates precious metals. Okay? And this happens not in an instant, this happens over a really prolonged period of time. Okay? So it's that factor of heat and time that really contributes to these, these really world-class precious metal ore deposits that we see out here. Uh, okay, so in Elkhorn, 1875 to 1953, production of lead, zinc, and copper. Uh, these are just some of the byproducts that help make money. The big money makers were uh, gold and silver. Today's dollar value, we're talking over $330 million or something worth of precious metals produced. That's today's value of that. Uh, as many of you know, it's a ghost town now, so I don't think there's much active mining going on today. But that could change if the price of metals rebounds. Okay, there's always this trade-off. You know, things that are economic now may be again in the future, and all it takes is an uptick in the price of commodities. Um, okay, so what's the ore SEBI? We've got load. These are classic quartz veins. You end up getting gold and silver and other sulfide minerals locked up quartz veins, and these are basically fluids coming off the crystallizing magma chain. They shoot up, they're hot, they've got a bunch of dissolved metals in them at depth. As they rise up to the surface, they cool and they freeze. Okay. Uh, so in loads, we end up getting gold and silver, uh, and these are related to porphyry, which is really just a fancy word for a crystal-rich magma body. Rock that's got a lot of crystals. We see load deposits a lot of times associated with these really crystal rich rocks. Scarns. Here's where you actually metamorphose the country rock. Okay, you're, you're, and when I say metamorphose, you're taking one suite of minerals and through pressure and temperature, you're turning them into another suite of minerals. Uh, with scarns, you're typically looking at uh, lastonite, it's one of the minerals I don't need to get into. And there's a real um, characteristic mineral assemblage associated with that. So scarns, very, uh, very big in Elkhorn. Uh, they were oxidized, which further enriched uh, the ore. Uh, I'll talk about that in the conclusion. Uh, and then we also get replacement deposits. And this is where you end up getting a fluid that's a combination of the fluid coming off the magma and whatever leaches from the country rock shooting through the rocks, usually within tight folds, and basically crystallizing out as, a, as an ore shoot. Okay. okay, so that's Elkhorn. Pretty impressive. Down here at the southern end of Bull Mountain, at the Golden Sunlight Mine, Open Pit Gold Mine, operating since 1975, they've produced over a billion dollars in today's dollars from this one mine. It's at its end of its life now. I think it's made the news uh, for laying off most of the staff recently. Right now, they are in the permitting for a new deposit just north of the mine. Okay, so they're, they're tracking the ore zone to the north. Uh, and they think they found something uh, that they could 
mine out, so they're trying to get it permitted right now. Okay, so what's the ore setting here? Uh, this is a boiling zone in close proximity to a magma chamber. Okay, so basically we've got that magma chamber at depth, and we've got boiling of probably groundwater uh, above it, and concentrating in those metals. It's happened about 80 million years ago, uh, and the ore deposit probably formed about three, five kilometers depth. It was later intruded by a basalt-like composition. It's the uh, lamp up here, it's a fancy word. Um, and along this low angle fault structure. Okay. So here is the wretched pipe, the boiling zone, where a lot of the uh, precious metals are found. Uh, but they're also found within this structure that cuts the wretched pipe. Okay. So this is a, a kind of a simple experiment. But if you look at this here, the top is slid that way relative to the bottom. That would make it kind of a, a a low angle normal fault, or kind of like a landslide. Okay, but in your brain, or in your mind, if you take this thing and you restore it up to vertical, which is likely how it formed, all of a sudden this thing becomes a thrust fault, which is consistent with the compression, the reverse faulting uh, of the full thrust belt at this time. Okay, so to my mapping, here's, one, here's an example of one of the uh, products that, uh, that I produce. Uh, so this would be the Whitetail Valley going up to Boulder. Uh, here's Bull Mountain. Um, and what I want to talk about, actually, this is one I've actually gotten published. <laughs> um, but what I want to do is talk about really two big observations that I've made in this quadrangle. Uh, so again, regional, here are, are where these spots are. Uh, more locally within the map area, this is what I'm talking about. So the first thing I want to talk about is this pink, pink unit and some of the observations we've made of that. This is geochemical da data, and again what I'm showing here is the composition of the rock. Okay, I mentioned in the beginning that I collect these rocks and I want to know what they are. And what's the importance? Well, in the case of that, we end up getting compositions that are called Shoshanites. Uh, being a geologist is like speaking a foreign language. <laughs> um, but the importance of that is that Shoshanites globally, these big intrusive masses are associated with massive silver or massive gold and copper deposits. Okay, so that's an interesting bit of information out there. Okay, so we've got this Shoshanite intrusion that's coming up through the Elkhorn Mountain Volcanics. I call them ignimbrites, which are really just big ash explosions. And they're rhyolites. Um, so how do these things form? These things form deep in subduction zones. Okay, so you've got these plates compressing. You've got one plate that's being pushed deep down in the earth. It starts to trigger melting. And those melts rise. And they erupt and they form <coughs> volcanoes like Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier. So that's what these are. These are deep melts that are coming off of a subduction zone. Okay. Uh, also interesting is that locally within these Shoshanites, we've got abundant sulfides. Again, here's another term that I'm going to use. Sulfides are, are metals. They're metallic, there's pyrite is a sulfide, okay? Fool's gold is a sulfide. The importance of that is that oftentimes gold and silver substitute uh, for, for iron in the crystal structure, okay? Mm -hmm. Not abundantly, but as trace, uh, trace amounts, okay? If you get enough of these things concentrated, you can get an economic word deposit. Okay, moving on. Uh, so now I'm down here. Observation is that I've got a low angle fault zone that looks identical to the one at the gold sunlight. Okay, so again we had that wretched pipe that was cut in half by this low angle fault zone. The same thing extends to the north all the way up, I would say, 
throughout the whole Bull Mountain area. Okay? So potentially the implication there is that you've got a mineralized zone that is essentially capping the entire mountain range. Uh, we dated the rock using potassium argon, so we separated out corn blend from this little uh, diorite intrusion. Uh, and we got a really nice age on it, 78 and a half plus or minus 0.2. This is what that fault zone looks like. Okay, so this used to be a nice, strong, tabular dike. It since got sheared up, rounded into little balls, and it is surrounded in a matrix of mud. Okay, so what was once a nice, tabular, strong, Igneous body got sheared up in the fall. Uh, yeah. And so that's what that looks like. I also, so I was interested that there were Shoshanites. Shoshanites are associated with mineral deposits. So I dug a little deeper and I got another data set of these more obscure elements that exploration geologists like to call pathfinders. So when you get little spikes in the Pathfinder suite, all of a sudden it becomes interesting, okay? Because you could be looking at, at uh, a metallic uh, deposit, a significant one depth. So what we hit on here are antimony and tellurium, okay? So these rocks within that fault zone have elevated antimony and tellurium. Uh, and these are two elements that are uh, associated with What I'm showing you is relative to an average basalt. So if you've gone to Hawaii, walked around on the beach, you walked on an average basalt. Okay. Relative to those, these are not average. Okay, they've got a strong sniff of, of metal. Okay, so moving up to the quadrangle to the north. So here I'm talking about the north end of Bull Mountain. Uh, here's Boulder Hot Springs. Uh, Ryan Mountain, Elkhorn District. And this is the quadrangle I mapped last summer. Uh, I'm working on getting this one uh, out uh, right now. Uh, and again, I'm just gonna talk about two of the more important observations in this quadrant. We'll start up here in the north. Again, just uh, west of the Elkhorn mine. Here we got a, an age from a zircon, and we dated a granite diorite porphyry intrusion. Okay, so this is basically just a granite that's really porphyry. Okay, lots of crystals, lots of quartz, lots of plagiar place. You can see them really easily. Uh, this thing is uh, one of the units I mapped because it had a nice quartzite eye texture. You break it open, and it looks like there's these little eyes of quartz looking. This thing also intrudes the Elkhorn Mountain Volcanics, which is that purple unit all along the flank. Uh, to date, we got an age of 80.2 from the Zircons. This would make this intrusion one of the oldest ones in the Batholith. Okay, so the Boulder Batholith is not just one rock. It's a composite body of many different intrusions. Okay, some are older. Uh, and then there's a main stage, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the main stage uh, of the Batholith, and that's the Butte Blue Zone, okay? That's the classic granite that you see as you go over Homestead. It's the classic granite you see in town here. So that's the main pulse of the Boulder Batholith, but there's also older, um, and, and I think one slightly younger. Uh, okay, so the significance of getting this age on this quartzite porphyry is that it's a match for some of these porphyry intrusions that are related to gold and silver load deposits right up at Elkhorn, okay? The porphyry uh, intrusions are associated with, with those mineral deposits at Elkhorn about five kilometers away. It's interesting to see a similar one down here uh, in Boulder. Okay, also really interesting in this quadrangle 
are these little limestone blobs that are aligned along the mountain front. There's been some adits that have been drilled into here. They go back quite a ways. I think Alan actually walked back into one. Uh, so what do I want to say about these? Uh, these are unlike any, any rock out here. Okay? These are old limestones. They got cooked and metamorphosed. They didn't quite get turned into scarves, but they did get mineralized. These are also like the Elkhorn District. Minerals include galena, sphalerite, pyrite. These are metals. Uh, we zapped it with a handheld XRF to try to get some idea of, well, is there any interesting, anything else interesting in here? Are we seeing gold and silver? One rock actually did show some gold, not a lot. Uh, but there was elevated silver, lead, and zinc. Okay, so again, similar to stuff that the Elkhorn is here. Okay, so the take home point. What I, what I want you guys to, to take home out of this. The whole mountain on the eastern edge of the Batholith. Batholith. It's volcanic top. This whole mountain range, I think, is an excellent target for mineral exploration. Okay? I'm not going to do it. Maybe nobody's going to do it for 100 years or until the price of metals goes back up. But there's a lot of indication, a lot of really interesting things going on here that I think would make this an interesting place to explore. Uh, specifically, High gold, silver, copper related to this lamp, uh, Shoshanite sweep that intruded all along the top of the mountain. I think it intruded along a thrust fault. I think that thrust fault is the structure that they're mining at Golden Sunlight. I think that's why they're finding the mineralization to the north. I think if they kept going, they would keep finding it. Um, Elkhorn type silver, uh, lead, and zinc replacement deposits right up here. That's consistent with contact metamorphism of the older rocks near the Butte Pluton. Okay? So, really, two interesting things going on here. This batholith coming in, cooking the older rocks, producing a belt of mineralization that goes this way, follows the contact. But there's also this north trending structure that I think is capturing a lot of that mineralization as well. Okay, so it's kind of a perfect storm for getting uh, a couple really different types of uh, mineral deposits. One related to this big magma body, the other related to this smaller uh, intrusion coming up along the thrust wall. Um, when did this happen? Uh, so again, it's related to volcanic arc, compression, subduction, uh, Mount St. Helens type volcanoes forming. Uh, fairly short interval, okay? So we get the volcanics, which are these purple units erupting in about 81 million years ago. We get these porphyry or really crystal rich intrusions forming at about 80. We get this Shoshanite magma intrusion along the thrust fault, right? Around the same time, a little younger, 79 to 80. And then finally, we get the emplacement of this big main phase of the Bowler Battler. Okay? And I think that final event actually helped enrich a lot of these older deposits. Okay? So I think you get mineralization before the main stage, and that mineralization is associated with the porphyry intrusions and the Shoshanites. And then as that main stage of the Battler comes in, it begins to oxidize and break down those older deposits. And by that, I mean it, it basically just starts releasing the metals that are locked up in earlier form deposits and concentrating them even more. Okay? That's all I got. I know that was a lot. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>
So the hot springs that we have today are actively forming ore deposits. Uh, there's a really great geologist in 1900, Walter Harvey Weed, that astutely observed that there was an ore deposit forming right now at Boulder Hot Springs. You can see the copper staining on the rock. You can see uh, evidence for um, gold and silver. Okay, so it's it, those boiling processes concentrate those metals. In the case of the hot springs that we have active today, like Boulder Hot Springs in Vermont, what's happening here isn't related to the magma body at depth. It's related to really deep circulation of groundwater. Okay? And what's allowing that really deep circulation is this younger phase of stretching that's been affecting western Montana. So you remember I, I said, well, we've got these all these active earth, earthquakes that are happening on top of the Fold Rust Belt today. We call that basin arranged block faulting. Okay? So it stretches the crust and where you get those earthquakes or faults is where the water seeps really deep as things get deeper, they get hotter. We call that the geothermal gradient. So it gets to a certain depth, and it gets so hot that it starts to boil and come back up. Could you go back to your one of your maps, like page five or something? Sure. And and then um, I want you to show us where the ringing rocks are. And how do those relate to all yeah. of this? Or maybe more of a close-up. Well, I think this is as good as it's going to get. Oh, okay. They, are they off the other maps? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> oh, this is fine. Okay, so the ring rocks are in the dry mountain quadrangle. Okay. Uh, and they would be right up around... So right, the kind of stuck right between the, yeah. I'm meeting at the Baffalith and the Volcanics, kind of yes. between there. So they're one of these older intrusions, correct me if I'm wrong here, anybody that knows. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Well, it's one of these older intrusions, and by older I mean it predates the main stage for the Butte Okay, so it's one of these older intrusions related to this magma system. Why do they ring? Well, I've been asked that question and answered it in a magazine article. And, uh, you know, the thing I like was it had to do with acoustics. Okay? It has to do with the fact that these rocks are freestanding. Okay? So if you think of a bell, if you ding it, if you're holding it and you ding it, it will ring. Set it on the ground, you ding it, it won't. Okay, so that's one thing. Another thing has to do with crystal structure. Okay, so the crystal structure is somehow controlling how energy sound is transmitted through the rock. Uh, one idea that I've heard that I like is that the rock was there, and then it came in and it got recrystallized or partly metamorphosed by the main stage <coughs> granite. Okay, and that later event or metamorphism did something to the crystal structure, something perfect. No, I, you know, so this happened, the, most of the stuff I haven't talked about today happened 80 million years ago. That was a different set of problems. If you were here 80 million years ago, you would have been fearing a subduction zone earthquake like they are right now in Seattle. Okay? You would want to buy earthquake insurance for that. Uh, you would also want to be aware that these volcanoes can explode and cover your house with ash in, in you know, not any minute, but you know, that would be one of the hazards. There would be volcanic hazards associated with being here 80 million years ago. Today, the hazards are mostly uh, seismic, okay, and that's because we live in the Intermountain Seismic Belt, and this is this zone of earthquakes again that we see in western Montana that tracks the old Bolton Rust Belt. The East Ridge, right out here, we've got the beautiful Lady of the Rockies sitting right up on top of the ridge. 
that is one of those block faults. Okay, so uh, how do I show this? Here's the Lady of the Rockies. Here's the Valley of Florida. The Lady of the Rockies used to be down here. Through earthquakes, through time, that ridge slowly gets higher relative to the Valley of Florida. Okay? So, um, you know, that ridge I can see outside my doorstep every morning. And I don't know, I want to be an alarmist, but that is a big fault. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that's one that she be studying a little more. So is she still moving up then? It, it's an active it's Still fault. active? Does that mean there's going to be a huge earthquake tomorrow? No. Does that mean that you should be aware that that could produce an earthquake at some point in time? Yeah. And I think we have the earthquake talk on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> so okay. And then Mike Stickney. Yeah, like, Mike Stickney oh, came and talked to us yeah. a, I think yeah. the, earlier this spring or winter. And uh, so he should be up here. <laughs> yeah. D Dick, did you have a question? No, I was going to make you talk about Raymond Rocks. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Okay, I'll get you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the Lowland Creek Volcanics that trough there. Yeah. What, what's that? What does that say? Good question. Uh, so I've been looking at these things for a while. Um, what I think they are, okay, so remember what I just said about the Lady of the Rockies, okay, those kind of block faults that we have, you know, very apparent, we can see them outside today. I think back during the Eocene Lowland Creek time, we had block faults that are forming at, at a different orientation, okay, so today now most of these big mountain ranges trend north-south, okay, Bull Mountain is a classic example, north-south, big block. East Ridge, north south, right? Big block. I think back in the Eocene time, those things are trending more northeast, southwest, but again, also forming block faults. So I think that that block faulting affected the Boulder Batholith. Basically, dropped a big floor in the middle of Batholith. We would call that a graben. It's a big basin. And all of these volcanics build in that basin. There's a lot of evidence that they are fissure related. Okay, so you'd have a fissure, which is really just a big, uh, a big linear crack. crack. <laughs> there you go. That magma comes up along in <clears throat> vents or volcanic vents on top of it locally. Okay, so if we could go back in Eocene time, we would expect to see vents forming all along within this. Fisher or crack. So have you spent any time looking at like the tuxedo or any oh, yeah. of those break yeah. systems out there? Yeah, there's a, that, there's a lot of evidence for boiling right. related to volcanic vents, especially over the tuxedo mine. Uh, Montana tunnels, you know, that's also formed with a vent type deposit within the lower creeks. Montana tunnels. So it's uh, west of Jefferson City. Yeah. And so that's another, you know, and there's mineral deposits always in there, again, along these northeast southwest trending. Mostly so, along the edge of that, then? Uh, no, you know, that's a good question, also. Along the edge, there are these boiling zones that I think are related to maybe the bigger vents, caldera type deposits, but then also within those, you get these fissures where you're also forming different types of deposits. So the big vents and small vents. So those mid, those mines just west of Butte, between Butte and Rocker, and primarily north of the interstate, uh, were probably related to the main... Yeah, you're talking about the Butte Zenith mine. Yeah. Yeah, so that was the, the next view, right? So when the big scramble was on to find the next uh, main, you know, really rich ore veins, that was a target, that little blob of granite that's sitting out there. They drilled a shaft 1,500 feet down in there, and they didn't find anything. So, you know, the, I, I did talk about the professor I'm collaborating with at Oregon State, but he knows a lot more about the being deposit than I do. His name's John Dillis. He actually 
actually got this training from people that worked at the Anaconda Company. Okay, so he's kind of a remnant of that thinking. And uh, at the Montana Tech seminar page, we've got a video of his talk. So if you guys want to learn really more about the details of the view of the pod, I suggest you, you link into Tech's webpage and look at their geology seminar series and, and listen to Dr. So, were the lowland creek volcanics associated with some younger, I mean, the magma chamber depth is at some younger phase of the boulder basalt, or is there a separate? No, I think it's more related to the Ipsericas, right? So, the Ipsericas are Eocene, and those are the mountain ranges that you see right outside of Yellowstone, right? So, how they relate, that's a great question. My big arm wave is that they're a caldera in the back arc. So behind <coughs> the Ipsarica arc, and they exploded, and they filled in the big drop that was forming behind the arc. Now I would just have to prove that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my question is up we know that there's other boulder baffles in the world. How many are there? Are the mineral deposits <coughs> similar? Are they the same scale? Yeah, I mean, so that's, you know, at the big scale, yes, they're very similar. They're all related to the same time. They got similar mineral for mineralization. Okay. Part of the big, same big geologic setting. On the small scale, like anything, once you go in and you start picking apart the details, they're different, mm -hmm. right? So the country rocks, in some cases, can be different. The enrichment, or how good the grade is, can be different. Um, and, and so the point I was making about John Dillis is he's been studying the Boulder Bath with for a career. And you know the last thing he said to me is, "It's weird. I don't, I don't completely understand. It's a, it's a really unique situation. There. Okay, right there, what has been mined out of the Bath lit is not found." Exactly anywhere else. Well, what about that theory or whatever that's written up somewhere? I think I read it about Lower Boulder Bathlip was actually above the Idaho Boulder Bathlip and they slid this direction. Yeah, so lot, the right? Idaho Bathlip is the same age as the Boulder Bathlip, right? And so some people yeah. think that it's been translated. East up to 30 kilometers, I think, is the right. estimate, and that would happen during folding and thrusting. I'm not sure about about what where I weigh in on that one yet. I'm not going to commit to anything. Cool. Sorry. Well, thank you, Caleb, yeah. very much. Thank you.